Hello and welcome to another episode of Geeky Cool. Uh, my name is Mandy. I am your host um, at geekycool.com. Uh, if you're new here, we have articles and trailers and more. We try to keep our website family friendly. Um, we are also uh, big into covering all the genres. So if you're into uh, sci-fi, fantasy, um, books, movies, video games, tabletop games, whatever it is, um, we try to cover it all. Um, you can find us at our website at geekycool.com. We are also on YouTube and Facebook. Um, so today we are interviewing um, author Dodge Marin, um, who has joined us here today to uh, talk about um, his books. So um, give a round of applause for Do uh, Dodge. <laughs> All right. So Dodge, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I've always had an active imagination and at some points very much overactive. And some point around fifth grade, I said, it's one of those things, I didn't really think much of it. It seemed like a good idea at the time. I just started like, oh, I'll write a story. And things for me developed slowly over time. So it was like no real instant moment when something happened. So I wrote that over the next four years, basically summers between uh, school. And eventually finished it and then did nothing for a couple more years and then got back and had an idea, started writing it down, and it kind of grew from there. Um, so you've always kind of been into writing since a young age. Um, was that like an escape for you or, you know, was it something comforting um, or is this more like a hobby? Um, it was more like a hobby at first. And when I was a kid, when I first started it, like most kids, I didn't want, like, we get a rep uh, uh, five page report we had to write for school. Like, yeah, I don't want to write five pages. Mm -hmm. But that was one of those things that over time, um, like, there were certain school events that we were required that were mandatory. But at least one of them, the teacher had a out where you could write a report instead of going to the event. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that because that was less uh, unappealing than going to a public event and singing or whatever they had. And over time, I was like, eh, this isn't too bad. doing, mm -hmm. And it just kind of fell into it, I guess. I totally understand that. I would definitely pick writing over having to go out into public because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's i'm i'm not comfortable with going and doing um new things like that um if i've never been to an event it, it's kind of nerve-wracking for me so i can i can definitely relate to preferring to write about it um than going going to the thing so um now the name dodge marin is actually a pseudonym or a pen name. How did you choose this name for yourself and why? Well, Dodger was a cat that I had um, back in the junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. And he was very special to me. And I actually credit him with making me, uh, helping me form who I am today. So I knew I wanted to use, uh, to honor him in some way. And it actually turned out where I used his name for one of my characters in the book mm -hmm. uh, as a nickname and her last name. And then after that, I chose my pen name. So it might be kind of weird people reading through. It's like, why is this his name? And it's a character in the book. That's why it's like the character came first and then I chose them. So Dodge mm -hmm. sounds better to me than Dodger. And then Marin is a uh, combination of my two current cats. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if your viewers will mind this, but I have one of them with me now. That's Hello. yeah. Is this now? Did, is this Mary or Pippin? This is Mary. Okay. And yes, both Mary and Pippin from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so M E R R Y, not M A R Y. Yeah. And then I just put those together and did a bit of a Google search, and not much came up. If anything came up for the name Marin. I have since found out that there's a Star Wars character named Marin, but cool. uh, there's no way to get 
something that's never been used before, or even if you do use it, somebody's going to end up using it shortly after you do so. Exactly. It's, and uh, I felt I needed a pseudonym because my name is pretty common. I know one mm -hmm. time whenever I went on Amazon and searched by author, because I was publishing under my name at first, mm -hmm. uh, over 30 other authors came up. So I was like, oh. I need something a little more unique to try and stand out a bit more. Absolutely. You know, and I, I get also I can empathize with that because um, my name, especially uh, locally, um, I know that there are at least three, maybe four uh, individuals with the exact same name that I have uh, mm -hmm. in our community alone. Um, and then because I've looked into uh, writing, uh, a, you know, a book, I haven't I haven't quite committed to that yet. I've I've put it off. Um, <laughs> And, um, but, you know, cause it's, it's for, for anybody that's interested in writing, I think, um, I'd say most of us have probably done a web search of mm. authors with our name. And it's like, oh, I, there's at least two that I know of that have my name. I believe one of them, um, cause my, my full name is Amanda. Um, I believe there's a gentleman because it's it's both uh, a male and female name. Most 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 people think of it as a feminine name, mm -hmm. but um, you know there's a gentleman writer with my name, and then uh, there's a there's a romance author uh, with my name also. So anyway, I've I probably will have to go down the route of coming up with a pseudonym too. So, but I I love that you're playing. Or you're not playing. You're you're paying um, uh, respect respects to your cats because that's you know that's really that's wonderful because our um, you know I know some people call them pets. Some people call them you know their fur babies or whatever. But they're um, they're important to us. You know they're they shape who we are and and they they're comforting and um, there's a lot. Uh, there's a, that I could go off on a on a tangent about how uh, animals are really good about um, helping uh, with any kind of social anxiety and, and therapy and all kinds of that stuff. But anyway, um, so let me ask you. So you chose to self go the route of self publishing versus corporate publishing. So why did you choose self publishing? Well, originally, it was just a way to get my foot in the door um, because I felt I'm generally not a very patient person. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I felt like, okay, I'm, it's going to take forever to get through the traditional publishing process. And so I, at the time, uh, self-publishing still kind of has a stigma to it that it's just people who can't write uh, but want to get their stuff out there and throw it out and but it was so i researched it a little bit and it was starting to become more professional mm -hmm. and get a better reputation and so i tried it out and it worked um worked out i should say mm -hmm. and i eventually i was wanting to go traditional publishing eventually but as i looked into it more uh say after i got my couple books out and i was like okay maybe it's time to go ahead and try traditional I yeah. found out that a lot of traditionally published authors are actually moving to self-publishing. Mm -hmm. And their reason, the main reason I heard for that was that it's basically the same thing. Uh, traditional publishing, they still expect you to do all the marketing and all the work and everything. And mm -hmm. all you really get is their name behind you. And which right. does help because people, oh, this is published by so-and-so. That does help get you out there. Mm -hmm. but then they take 10, 20%, um, which depending on the self-publisher company that you go through, they still take part of the revenue anyway. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, okay, I'm doing all the work and you're taking a part of the cut. It doesn't seem like this is, so I've just stuck with traditional publishing and I'm hoping my next book, I'm looking into other companies that, I don't know, kind of like a mix between self and, uh, traditional publishing mm -hmm. and but that's 
right now I consider my current series mm -hmm. closed uh, to edits and everything because I was getting stuck in the trap of I was going to be editing it forever yeah. and rewriting it 50 times. I mean, as it is, it's like the third rewrite. So I told myself I had to close it. And if I want to change publishers now to somebody who's a bit more traditional, I'm going to have to edit it again to their style. And mm -hmm. So I'm hoping my next book, that's when I'll really dig into and research more about different publishers. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, and I should say to self-publishing, again, it depends on what publisher you go with, what company. Mm -hmm. But there yeah. are also... You're, you're talking about like KDP and... and yeah. KDP uh, and Lulu.com. Yeah. All the different ones. Yeah. But uh, uh, I know KDP, though, it's free, completely free. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they just get their part by taking a cut from the revenue, like I said. And mm -hmm. uh, traditional publishing, again, um, technically, it's free, or you get paid like uh, an advance or whatever. Mm -hmm. But self-publishing does allow you a process to do it for free and get your book out there without having to spend a bunch of money. Right. And that was another one of those things, too, when it started out, it had that stigma with it, that there was, that basically you'd be put, handing out spiral notebook. Right. Uh, now, but it's come really come a long way to, with the software and the programs they have to make these books professional looking and I yes, agree. you do have to put the work into it, but it's very much a process. If you are an independent type person or just mm -hmm. motivated, it can you can get it done for mm -hmm. no out of pocket expense other than your time. I agree. I mean, there's it's come a long way even just in the last ten years of um, accessibility, um, the print quality, um, print on demand. That way, you don't have to. I mean, like you could bulk order um, to be able to hand out at like uh, book signings or conventions and stuff like that. And I know a lot of um, authors that do that. Um, or if you don't have the money to purchase um, a large stack to keep and store, some some authors go the uh, e-reader, you know, like the Kindle version route or the print on demand. So um, like Amazon, they'll, uh, like if a, if a person wants to purchase a physical copy, they can go onto Amazon and, and purchase it and they'll print it and bind it there and send it to you. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different options and Amazon isn't the only, um, it's the, it's one of the big, or is the, is one of the most well-known and yeah, there, but they definitely had the free process. And I know one really exciting thing that's still relatively recent and still developing is now hardcover books. Yes, you really they, couldn't get hardcover books self-published before, but now they, I really wish whenever I'd done mine that had been, because it's too big to be a soft cover, but at the time I didn't have the option. Yeah. And I, yeah, I get that too. Cause you know, sometimes you wish you could get um, a really nice, um, you know, like one of those tall hardcover books for your bookshelf. Um, mm -hmm. I have a few of those um, with some of my uh, favorite um, fantasy authors on my bookshelf. Um, so, okay. So before we get too far into our interview, tell us about the genre of your books and any content or trigger warnings that readers should be aware of uh, before digging into them. They are science fiction military. Okay. Um, I just had a bit of a brain freeze there. That's okay. Um, so I try to go for movie ratings are just easier for me. And I try to go, keep it like a PG-13. I prefer a family-friendly uh, approach, mm -hmm. even with... And I know there is a spectrum of opinions on this. I don't really view violence itself as um triggering it's how it's depicted like if you throw in a bunch of blood and gore then yes mm -hmm. it's definitely not family friendly but just the act of two people fighting mm -hmm. isn't but so that's and so nothing comes to mind 
for me as a far as trigger warnings other than just straight up violence military armies going at each other but i don't describe the wounds or anything like that i just say so and so did this and so and so and that's where it's lent and i'll leave the rest to the imagination if you want to imagine more then fine go for it but, okay and i and don't that's, have that's good to know because some people might might um shy away from something um because i know some some authors do enjoy or do go into graphic detail and that's not something that you do so um so a reader that might be that might want to read it but might be afraid that it gets too gory um you're saying that it's it's it doesn't you don't go into that kind of detail um, yeah i mean there is one scene that i just remembered that kind of approaches the line mm -hmm. but again it's just describing what happened to him and if you have an understanding of such things then yeah but I don't really get into detail describing the actual look of it. And then again, I don't have swear words. If there's a scene where somebody, it makes sense that somebody would be swearing, mm -hmm. I either make up a word okay. or I just say in a, like a dialogue tag, some so-and-so cursed their enemy. Yeah. Or like cursed under his breath or yeah, yeah something like there, there is a way to because i know um that's a point of contention for or controversy for for a lot of people some people are like well you know life's not all uh fluffy bunnies and rainbows but you know there is a way of going about it without um i don't know being having to read or hear um, swear words constantly. Yeah. So, um, I do like that. Um, uh, that's one thing I really like about your book, uh, or your book series is that, um, they are something that I would feel comfortable with my teenager reading, um, because I don't have to worry about him. Uh, you know, there's no sexual scenes. Um, there's no swearing. Um, there's no like, gratuitive violence you know just doing it for the sake of uh violent for the sake of violence you know there's a reason for, for it because, shock value yeah yeah that whole shock and all you know it's like all right you know there's there's a market for that but that's not what these series you know this book the story is what's important and the dynamic between the characters so there's more to the story than just and I'm glad you said that, that the story is what's important, because that's how very much how I feel about it. And I feel, again, it's realistic that people swear and mm -hmm. things get gory, especially in a battlefield and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But it also just distracts from the story. It's just, like I said, shock value. Mm -hmm. And let's see on um, what you said about feeling OK with your teenager reading it. That's something that's stuck in my head that I somebody out there said once. I don't remember who but I read it and it really stuck in my head that I think it was about a commercial where they were um, making it overly sexualized and commercial and it had absolutely nothing to do with the product. Right. But what somebody commented on it was parents with kids are going to spend a lot more money than one, one horny guy. Right. So that's, that's another reason why I keep it family friendly too. It's like, yeah. Hey, I it's want, it's something for okay to me i like it or i i compare it to um accessibility so um there was a a, a kind of like a comic strip kind of like a meme but it was like a teaching moment and it was a person shoveling the snow off of some steps and a wheelchair user came up and said well if you clean the ramp we can all use the ramp if you clean the steps, I have to wait for you to clean the, the ramp, you know, the wheelchair ramp too. And that's the thing with writing a story, um, that is, um, available, that would be more accessible or available for a broader audience like teenagers, um, young adult, new adult, it, you know, I'm not saying that it's only for that because any age, can appreciate young adult and new adult. Um, but those with more um, conservative um, um, feelings, 
um, mm. that, that may struggle with finding something that they feel appropriate for their children. You know, the pickings are kind of slim. So this is something that can cater to um, a person who's who's trying to uh, protect their children from some of that um, or somebody that just may not feel comfortable uh, reading um, excessive, you know, gore and foul language. So so to me, it's having something kind of rated PG-13, like you said, um, that makes it more available, you know, it makes it available to more audiences and instead of just like that niche um, genre or that niche audience that, you know, like, for example, um, the the George R. R. Martin uh, books, um, I can't remember the uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah, Game of Thrones. Like it is. I don't know. Like, I don't feel comfortable and I'm a grown adult, you know, I'm old enough that I could have grandkids, but I'm, you know, I don't feel comfortable with some of the scenes and and the things that are said and done. And I'm, and I get it, you know, it's, it is an adult um, series, but I don't know. I don't know what the, what the right way to say this, um, it's not it's, for everyone. It makes me feel unsafe. Um, it makes, it hurts. I think a friend of mine says um, it hurt her heart to read and be around, you know, like I, it's not good for me mentally, like my, my mental health. I can't be around that kind of stuff because it hurts and, my mental. I think that's heart. a very good way of putting it. Uh, Cause that's one thing that I've tried to explain to people before. Cause I read, a few of those, I don't remember which, uh, if it was the fourth one that I mm-hmm. finally stopped at. Um, because the story is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I was actually talking to uh, a friend not too long ago about the HBO series of Game of Thrones oh. and why I thought that was something that shouldn't be watched because, of course, they put all that in the show too. Yeah. And basically what it comes down to it does have a lot to do with is it right for you is it okay for you mm-hmm. and if it is then fine i'm not going to try and stop yeah. you from watching to what each, you enjoy yeah, to each their but own. the thing that i try to describe and a lot of people don't understand is i'm a very visual thinker whenever mm-hmm. i read something like that i get as if i'm seeing it for real or experiencing I, it with your own body you yeah, know. exactly. Uh, even feeling the pain, the emotional pain, the physical pain. Mm-hmm. And so one of the writers and TV shows, whatever, go into that much detail, like if they're showing a torture sequence or something, it's mm-hmm. like, I'm being tortured. And yeah, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of people don't understand that. They think they, they just need to get over it or whatever. It's yeah. like, no, that's not something you get over. That's part of who you are. Mm-hmm. And like I said, if you are able to... and uh not have it affect you then great yeah and i do have a fear i mean this is a highly controversial area so i won't say not, but uh that you do get accustomed to it and mm-hmm. it's like it's okay for those things mm-hmm. so yeah, it does do. take a certain mindset to not let that change who you are to become those types of people mm-hmm. I agree. It it does tend to desensitize you after a while when you hear it and see it after a while. I'm I'm also thinking like there's there are those that have been traumatized and some of those things could cause a traumatic uh, relapse or or like PTSD or um, and it's and I can't. And like you said, to each their own, you know, is I, I'm not saying censor things by any means. I am not into censorship because um, that comes with a that's whole, a, yeah, whole it's a slippery other, slope. Yeah. Like I think, but I, you know, and people should be allowed to read and watch uh, at their own discretion of what they think is appropriate for themselves. But, um, you know, anyway, the main point was, you know, this is something that can be for everybody. 
Um, and I do because yeah, like I will pull that, try and pull that back around to the subject that I have had people tell me, "Oh, you need to put in sex scenes, or you need to have cursing and stuff." I was like, "No, Why? that's that's not my story. Mm -hmm. That's not what I want to show." Exactly. And they will even come straight out and say something. Oh, you'll sell more books that way. It's like, I'm the type of person, like, that may be true. I don't care. If that's mm -hmm. what you want, I don't want your money anyway. Yeah. And that, um, you know, that's that's not what you write. Um, it's an it's art to me, not a product. Yeah. That's like telling a, a, a painter, oh, you should use watercolors. They'll sell better. You know, that, well, like, but I like acrylic. You know, that you... Don't tell people what they should and shouldn't do with their own creativity. You know, they, you do what is right for you and your audiences, um, you know, the people that like what you create and what is authentic to Dodge is, are those who, I don't know, you would like attracts like, you know, you tend to, you grow the audience that is meant for you. Which is a very big reason why I got into writing in the first place, because I was having trouble finding what I wanted to read. Mm -hmm. And I finally got to the point, it's like, fine, I'll do it myself. And hopefully there are other people out there who want what I want. Exactly. I agree. All right. So, well, we went down a rabbit hole with that one. <laughs> but it's, yeah, you know. Yeah, that is a danger great. with me. <laughs> me too. Uh, but that's, you know, it's an important topic to talk about, you know. Um, so we, we already answered this question and I said, what age range would you feel is appropriate? And so I think you kind of already worked that one. Um, so if you could compare, and I have a feeling, I know what, uh, the answer is to this. If you could compare your books to other books, TV series or movies, what would you say your book series is like? Well, I've had people tell me before that it reminds them very much of Star Wars. Okay. And usually that comes from a basic description of it. And I'm always confused about because it like, yeah, so people fighting in space and you immediately think of Star Wars. It's like, okay, there's so many more things. Star Wars is not that. Star Wars is has the Force and the Jedi and Sith. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes Star Wars unique. Star Wars oh. is fantasy, and a lot of people yeah. are not aware of that one, but that's a whole nother. And I agree with that. <laughs> I've heard that recently that it's space fantasy or mm -hmm. science fantasy, not science fiction. Mm -hmm. While mine is more science fiction, mm -hmm. it is. I can't really. Now, this is probably what you meant when you said uh, you thought you know what I compare it to. Babylon 5 is my mm -hmm. favorite TV series. Yes. I don't have a whole lot of. I don't feel like there's a whole lot of crossover or comparison between the two. Mm -hmm. They're very different, but it is was was and is very inspirational to me. And so I'm sure some of that worked its way in there. Yeah. Uh, especially with the characters, mm -hmm. making the characters realistic and seem human and round uh with their flaws and everything, mm -hmm. which to be honest, I feel like I still need to work on the flaws side of the characters. Sometimes mm -hmm. they come off a little too perfect. But as far as beyond that, I can't really compare. I find it, hard to compare. I'm sure other people out there, because every once in a while I'll get somebody come in and it's like, oh, this is just like this other thing. It's like, well, I never heard of that other thing. So, okay. so yeah, if anybody's out there watching this and you've read Josh's books, be sure to contact them and let them know this reminded me of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Um, your, your books. So we, we kind of touched on this a little bit. It is epic warfare. You know, it's kind of more on a large scale. We do have, um, some scenes that are, um, interpersonal. Um, and then you also see scenes that it's like, um, groups, um, and they're interplanetary. So there's some space battles and there's some, uh, on the ground skirmishes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so someone might see, um, might compare it to like world war almost, but it's universal or, you know, in the universe or in space, you know, between planets and, and factions and groups. Um, yeah. cause the thing it escaped my mind while he asked if I was anything compared to, but I just glanced over mm -hmm. and I have a copy sitting there. Um, if I did, 
something that probably is close ish is mm-hmm. Starcraft the game. Okay. That I would uh, say is pretty comparable. All right. Uh, different story, but similar setting. And I don't know if you've ever played or you know of it, but uh is that the one that recently came out? Um but there's something that somebody's uh you're that... thinking of Starfield. Oh that yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I was thinking. That's not it. Yeah. What about um, Command and Conquer? Have you played any of those games? I played those, but those are more modern, current day technologies and stuff. So yeah, similar story, I guess you could say. Because mm-hmm. what you say about the different factions. Um and that's the at least at first, I don't want to get into too many spoilers here, mm-hmm. but for much of the book, it's just different human nations and mm-hmm. their relations with each other and fighting and their uh, beliefs that mm-hmm. conflict with each other and how they deal with that or try to destroy each other or try to work, cooperate even with, that's how... I put it, and then the big factions, like the governments, the nations, then they have their sub factions, the criminal organizations, the well, parties, and, so, and the democratic republic systems. And yeah, and sometimes you get into, um, like with even today, um, a person may be a part of a certain faction, um, but they may disagree with the way their government is running things. Um, things aren't always cut and dry um but and while we're on the topic uh i wanted to point out aren't those the flags behind you of some of the factions yes um what you real quick what you said about somebody might not fully believe in what their nation's doing Mm -hmm. that is one thing that i wanted to do is i wanted to i didn't want to paint any side as fully good or fully bad the mm-hmm. people who are doing even the so-called bad guys, they're doing it because they believe in their cause. They're not doing right. it to be evil. Most of them. Yeah. Right? It's There's... not like a traditional like cartoon bad guy. It, no. it It's, it's more, that's what I really like about your stories is that um, they show the point of view of each group that, um, because like, okay, for, for, we'll use modern day, for example, um, with Putin and Russia, mm-hmm. he believes in what he's doing is right. He has a certain belief system. There's a reason why he does the, th- you know, he has motives. He's a human. He has, he does, or I would hope he's human. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. But um, anyway, uh, he's there's a reason behind his actions and the same for Palestine and the same for Israel and all the, um, and Ukraine and all the things that are going on today. Like we see in the news. Um, it's way too easy to just slap a label on people. uh, Yeah. I think that defines them, but there's a lot of gray area. You do what you, why you do. Mm -hmm. Do you think that somebody else isn't the same way? Exactly. And so that's what's unique about uh, the Star Chronicles, which we haven't even (laughs) specifically talked about yet. Here we are 30 minutes in and we haven't even discussed specifically the books. But uh, that's what I love about your books is that um, they um, the characters are you can identify with them Mm. because they're flawed. They're human. um, And they don't always make the best choices or they're caught between a rock and a hard place. Like my boss wants me to do this, but I can't because my morals say I, I, you know, like, and that's, or, yeah. uh, I know in the beginning of the book, uh, one of the main characters, he's ordered by his superior to do something and he knows is probably going to cost them the battle. But he has to do it anyway, but he does work it out in a certain way where he tries to basically, well, he didn't exactly specify this, so I can do a little different here. Mm-hmm. And that kind of thing. Or bends the rules a little bit. To... Yeah. And this is something I hear a lot of people saying about like the new Star Wars content. Why would he do something like that? That's absolutely ridiculous. That makes no sense. 
but people act on emotion all the time. And they I do. have sometimes my characters act on emotion and get themselves in trouble. Yeah, I know I've done that. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. <laughs> so, and, yeah, I, I think to hold a character up to a certain standard, and uh, I don't know. It's just unrealistic. It is unrealistic. And, and I think that's the difference between um, good writing and better writing, you know, um, so, um, anyway, you were going to yeah. show us the flags. Yeah, the flags. So the <laughs> one with the stars yeah. and that one is, uh, a good example of us saying about the differences and beliefs and things fall apart or hold together. The one with the stars is the, for the Valen union. Mm -hmm. And what they were is the n nations that currently exist. Um, there were smaller nations in their history. A lot of them were either conquered or chose to ally. The Union is one that they chose to the ally. Uh, the Blue Star represents the home planet, the one that basically led the unification movement, and that's uh, blue. And so each star represents a na one of the original nations that joined. But there were more nations in there that left for one reason or another. And those uh, reasons are explored. Uh, within the book because then they at some point they basically have to go back to them it's like hey we need help mm -hmm. uh we worked together in the past can we work together again and so mm -hmm. they're like oh well we left for a reason mm -hmm. and then the red one is the ordeon empire mm -hmm. and that's the seal the emperor's on it and that seal and so Yes, on the surface, at least, they're a very stereotypical empire. They want to take everything over because they think they're right. Everybody else is stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, if, if they would just let us rule, things would be so much better. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And so that seal tells the story of mm -hmm. a founding and their personality. Can't, they're kind of authoritarian, screen, aren't they? Huh? They're more authoritarian. Yes. Um, kind of and a, I do say... Uh, beyond the style of government, basically, if you take out voting and elections, mm -hmm. uh, life within the empire, I think, would be very similar to the average li life of the average American. Okay. They're not tyrannical. I mean, yeah, the, their enemies call them tyrants, but basically, mm -hmm. if you are a law-abiding citizen, you mind your own business. Life's then, not so bad. Yeah, and it's not so different from how we live. And mm -hmm. it does tell the story, like I said, you don't know how well you can see it on the video, but there's the flames in the background, okay, represents the chaos. I'll pull you up here to be a little, oh, wait, no, not me, the other one. <laughs> ah. Yeah. We'll just describe those curtains behind you. I know. Like, oh, wait, no, not that one. Not that one. I'm sorry. I'm being ridiculous here. Oh. No Trust me, I'm not a friend of technology either. I guess. See here. I wonder. Well, no, because if I remove it, then I don't know. Well, actually, in the our video clip, we'll be able to see the flags a little bit better. Okay. Um, but so... okay. what's oh, the stronger? Ready? Yeah, what's the stronger together? Oh no, you're still oh, talking about. Yeah. Sorry, I, I just like to tell that it tells a story. It's not just a symbol to look cool. It mm -hmm. So there's flames for the background and the seal. And that mm -hmm. represents the chaos that humanity was in. And let's see, and this is backwards mirrored here. So I'm like, so they got the first emperor here with his star and I spy guards on either side. Representing he came out and crew, uh, to put an end to the chaos. And this... Was, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I got like a cityscape here representing the civilization that he, they built. Mm -hmm. And then these swords saying that they will defend what they built. Okay. I and like the, that. And I don't then, think I, I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, oh, I don't sorry. think I've ever heard you um, or listened to you uh, describe it before, but oh, okay. I do like that it, you know, the seal, um, you know, it makes me think of our, our state seal. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a reason for each symbol, um, but I like that you put a, that much thought into it. That's really cool. And then the stronger together, like you were asking. Um, the, spoiler alert. 
Uh, but it happens very early on in the book, so it's not that bad a spoiler. The U Union mm -hmm. is destroyed. Okay. Uh, Stronger Together flag is basically the survivors. Well, they're destroyed by the Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the survivors create resistance movement. And at least with the aim of restoring the Union. But until that happens, they felt they needed another flag. And also to represent the nations that are assisting them. And so they created the Galactic Confederacy. And so mm -hmm. that's a symbol to recognize, um, not recognize, uh, symbolize a galaxy. Mm -hmm. And then that's one of those things I haven't quite decided with the languages in there yet. Which mm -hmm. one am I going here? I'm trying to, okay. Uh, <laughs> I have the same problem. So it's over seven, it's like 700 years in the future is where my story is set. Okay. So languages evolve over that time. And I did, I have thought about that with the flag, uh, with the English, modern, current English on there. Mm -hmm. But I'm no Tolkien. I'm not a language nerd to mm -hmm. really go in and dig into how the language has changed. So it's one of those things I kind of pass over. It's a, I drop a couple of hints in there that they're not speaking English at all, or if it is, it's a different version. It's like Star Trek when they talk about galactic common or uh, into, you know, um, it, yeah, uh, they're universal translators. Yeah, um, or I think you might have been thinking Star Wars with common, oh, or, maybe. Or the basics, and I know galactic D &D, basic, yeah, yeah, and I know D and D also has like common, so it's mm -hmm. like whatever the common language is, we all understand each other. We all speak the same language, so. So with the stronger together being on there, I haven't decided yet if that's actually uh, words that they use mm -hmm. in their whatever, however in, in, uh, English looks at that point in time, mm -hmm. or if it's something more akin to Latin, like we use okay. here in America, we put Latin mm -hmm. mottos on our stuff. So mm -hmm. it might be one of those things that in their time, that's Latin to them. <laughs> This is true. They may be like, what does that say? I'm like, well, yeah, I wanna, it's a dead language. <laughs> it just sounds cool. Yeah. But it, does, it means something, but it also sounds cool. But it sounds cooler than if we used our own language. Speaking of which, um, have you considered, um, which this could be a whole other podcast, um, looking into having different translations of your books? I have thought about it. I haven't actually looked into it or researched it. It's something I would certainly enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. But there's a couple of reasons why not to do that. One, English is basically the uh, commercial language, uh, international language anyway. I think it is officially recognized. That Don't quote oh, me really? on that because I don't know for sure. <laughs> but from yeah. what I understand, because... And I'll just... One reason, I had a co-worker once who was from Mexico mm -hmm. and somebody said to her something about wanting to learn Spanish. And she said, don't bother. Everybody else is taught English anyway. Oh, wow. So okay. that's one reason why not to worry too much about getting it translated. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part of it is like, I have trust issues. So mm -hmm. <laughs> if I don't know the language, uh, how do I know they're actually translating mm -hmm. it in a way out right. and saying what I said? That would be, yeah, you'd have to really have, um, somebody that's vetted, mm -hmm. you know, like a, I don't know if it would be a company or a, or even just like a freelance, but somebody that, like or you least, said, would be able to translate it in a way that doesn't just ruin everything. Yeah. Or at least know? get a friend or whatever who knows the language. And it's like, okay, can you make sure that they didn't throw in a bunch of swear words on me? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. And, like, like the people getting Chinese, tattoos and they say like hot dog or whatever yeah <laughs> like uh, what if it what if it's just yeah so yeah that is something to consider uh you'd have to make sure somebody um who spoke the language um would be able to that somebody you could trust um yeah. and to be able to back it up and be like yeah this is this is definitely like you'd almost want somebody that's um uh a polyglot um to be able to um 
back it up and 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 confirm that you know yeah this is true to the the story yeah because okay. then there are things that are lost in translation too and mm -hmm. so how many books do you currently have available and what are you currently working on i have i'll just five books available mm -hmm. and one uh one anthology so basically six books Mm -hmm. uh, four books are of a mini series, and uh, those are ones that are in an anthology. And then uh, a short stories collection based in the same uh, world. And that kind of like go, uh, some of the short stories are ca the character origin stories. So it expands on how the characters got into what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some history stuff, like going back hundreds of years to how the nations were formed. So that's the short stories. Okay. And what I'm working on now, which working on, I should put in quote, because a lot of my time has been taken up trying to market and get an engagement up and all that. But mm -hmm. it's a fantasy uh, story. It's got a duology, so book one, book two. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what the exact term is. It's not high fantasy. It's more like a realistic historical setting but with my own made up world and made up civilization. So there's, okay. and there's a bit more fantastical elements in it. Like one civilization has some kind of like steampunk, but with crystals instead of steam is one civilization. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So and, it's like not, not so much with the magic, but more with um, innovation. And... Innovate. And cause I really wanted to research, I don't know, and didn't, I didn't think of it until now, but maybe it's just my own excuse to motivate myself to research things that I found interesting in history. Mm -hmm. But I wanted it to be recognizable for a certain era. And because, well, we have, they can see this, right? One of the, in the recording, what you have up Yes. There. So this is my motto here with EVR, epicness, vastness, realism. So I'm really kind of digging into the realism on this fantasy story. And one way to do that is looking at the actual historical civilizations and going from there. And yeah, there are some things I'm changing because it's fantasy. I can do what technically do whatever I want, but True. I'm starting um, getting it grounded in realism and the actual history first and then seeing what I want to change from there. That makes sense. I like that. All right, so this is um, what you see on your screen, all the different contact information. So if you want to find Dodge's books, you can go to Amazon and you can follow him on Facebook, Instagram, and he has a YouTube uh, page where he posts updates and um, videos, which we have and we'll, uh, um, we'll show here after our slideshow. Um, but I'd like to talk about our, your books a little bit without getting into too much. Um, uh, like spoilers or anything. Yeah. You know, I don't want to spoil it, but I think people would get a kick out of, um, uh, out of all the books, you know, having you talk about them a little bit. Okay. Well, Triumphant Empire, book one of the series of the Star Chronicles. Star, as you see, is an acronym. Uh, it stands for Surrender Today or Adamantly Resist. Mm -hmm. um that's one of those things like eh, if i were doing it today i probably wouldn't have called it that star is just overused in science fiction but mm -hmm. at the time and then i made it unique by making an acronym there you go. but i started with the idea of what if the good guys lose mm -hmm. and that became the theme of do you ever give up fighting for what you believe in yeah at what point like are you gonna are you gonna resist forever or, or are you gonna like like uh, everything you know is gone and destroyed. Do you mm -hmm. give up at that point or are you, do your beliefs uh, stand despite what's you know, going on in your environment, what others have done to you? That's a, that's a very poignant, poignant question, you know, to ask um, at okay. what point do you, um, I don't know. Um, do you convert or do you just give up and just live your life? Yeah. And, Cause that's, basically more or less why i wrote it and my motivation there is i don't know if i would ever give up uh mm -hmm. is there something terrible enough somebody could do to me that i will 
give up my sincerely held beliefs and at least pretend or fully convert to what they have. And mm -hmm. so this series was kind of an exploration of that question for myself. That's deep. <laughs> All right. So, and the main players in Triumphant Empire, like you said, were the, or, or yeah, Triumphant Empire, which is the Empire versus the, the Union. Union. Mm -hmm. Which the Union is the, it starts out at the end of a hundred year long war between the two. Okay. And the Union is down to just one last bunker. Oh, and my goodness. Like I said, kind of a spoiler alert, but it happens right in the beginning too. The Empire mm -hmm. takes the base, and then the remain, but some remaining soldiers are able to flee and escape, mm -hmm. and so they're the ones that end up building resistance. And, and it's like, yeah, that's one thing where the, they, the Empire, left the head of state alive, and well, he was taken prisoner, mm -hmm. but they. Basically, he still held that position. And once they took that bunker and they're like, okay, you got nothing left. Mm -hmm. uh, they got him to, they didn't coerce him. They kind of basically talked him into it because he had lost. Yeah, obviously. like, do you just do, want if, all yeah, these to, people to die for no reason? Or yeah, do you so just they want... got him to issue an official surrender. And yeah. so these soldiers that escaped, like, okay, well, we don't have a nation anymore. But their you know command... What? That reminds me of like the beginning, like the pilot episode of Firefly, the brown coats of, you know, where they're just like, oh, we'll never surrender. And they're like, no, they just issued the surrender. It's like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so I, know, um, I didn't even think of that comparison myself, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's a little bit. But then, of course, there, there wouldn't be a story if it ended there. There. We exactly. the high ranking officer rallied them together. It's like, no, what we believe in is worth fighting for, no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, we Freedom. can't let we can't let our yeah exactly we can't let our beliefs die. Right. Exactly. We can't let them get away with this. No. All right. The next one. So book two in the series is Revolution. Can you discuss that a little bit, or uh, without, or is that just give it all away? Oh no, I can explain it a little bit. Um, that's where the resistance movement. So in the first one, Triumphant Empire, the resistance is basically just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And they do find some pirates to ally themselves with, to mm -hmm. make use of those resources and stuff that they no longer have. And of course, the pirates want something in return. Well, of course, they're pirates. <laughs> when revolution, uh, they get their feet under them and they really start, like the Empire does have a, uh, their human but from a certain planet of slaves they're all slaves okay. so they start a slave rebellion with those guys all right. and they really start and then they start uh talking to other nations like hey we lost there's nobody to stop them from coming after you now we got to work together so yeah. that's what revolution is about and each title i like with triumphant empire i do did try to be very careful to end it in a way that is still relevant to the title. So in the end of Triumphant Empire, the Empire is still triumphant and revolution, they're still revolting, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. I also like the uh, nod to, and I think this is something we talked about in the past, um, the nod to the statue of... Um, the flag raising on Iwo Jima. Yes, you know, there's just something... Um, yeah, so you have the rebels there trying to float down, but the Imperials are trying to hold it up. And Yeah, that's quite the image. <laughs> All right. Book three is titled Total War. And that one is kind of self-explanatory. The uh, rebels. Gosh, those rebels. <laughs> yeah, the rebels at this point finally get enough together to where it's no longer like a resistance or a rebellion, but they got a coalition of nations working together now. And mm -hmm. this is where they formed the Galactic Confederacy. Right. And, like that stronger uh, together. Yeah, um, exactly. And uh, so they go head on to the empire and all out total war. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier, kind of like a world war type scenario because yeah. the empire uh, will either conquer or make deals with other nations to get them on their side. And of course the Confederacy is doing the same thing. Not and to be confused with uh, civil war union and Confederacy. This is more. No, this is yeah. 
that was because that was the one thing I found humorous in the past before that I never even realized until far into the process, like Union and Confederacy. Oh, okay. It was so <laughs> unintentional. <laughs> yeah. But this is more like Axis and Allies, you know. Pretty much, but, except that but, those who do less. join the Empire, they basically have to become part of the Empire. They're mm -hmm. not, the Empire doesn't ally. They yeah. absorb. Well, I mean, less less Nazi-ish, I think. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it kind of depends how you look yeah. at it, I guess. But then, <laughs> yeah. of course, there are a couple of nations that are brought into it because they had to go one side or the other had to go through that nation to attack something on the other side mm -hmm. and so they end up getting drawn into the war because of that and they have yeah. to pick a side or allow their territory to be violated and whatnot mm -hmm. not unlike world war ii i yeah. mean i think that is a good comp i mean like we keep going back to it but um because yeah, germany went through belgium to get to france right so i mean like there's there's a lot of um so even like a history nut might get a kick out of this um, if they like science fiction too. And that's one thing I'll throw in there real quick is I have gotten some uh, pushback from people mm -hmm. saying, oh, you're just trans uh, putting current day problems into the future and outer space. We'll solve those problems by then. I totally disagree. We'll still be humans several hundred years from now. We'll still do the same mm -hmm. stupid stuff. And Well, that was uh, like the Firefly um series you know the uh, joss whedon which i know is problematic for reasons i won't go into but um you know his inspiration for that was what if it's the future and space travel is a thing um and we still have the same problems that we have today which is um there's poverty there's um you know little skirmishes there's pirates and there's you know just overreaching governments and the people well, who fight yeah. back against them and all the things that you have to deal with today you know those problems may not so it's not like see star trek kind of has that um utopia a bit yeah. yeah that mindset of oh yeah you know we don't have to worry about money anymore um We've evolved we're just past that. Yeah, yeah, we're exploring space to meet new people and all that kind of stuff and to learn new things. And but you know, where Firefly was like, No, yeah, we still have the same problems we've got today. We're still um, human. We're still human. There's always gonna be somebody out there exploiting somebody else because yeah. And so I think that's that's kind of the same thing with um with Total or with your series, the Star Chronicles. Um it's still we're still fighting um because there's so everybody has a different opinion mm. and not everybody's going to agree and there's going to be groups of people that i don't know are gonna yeah people won't agree or they're just plain selfish and yeah it's like i want yeah. what you have and you don't want to give it to me and so we're gonna fight about it and draw and i don't want to work for it to make myself and exactly like, yeah. so there's yeah resources and all that okay so brink of extinction this one is i do have to be a bit more careful not to give spoilers but right. basically another faction shows up dun, dun, that, dun. yeah they, they didn't even know existed mm -hmm. and they this new faction was waiting for this moment where everybody's at each other's throats and they're weakened by all the fighting mm -hmm. and they're coming in to kill them all yeah literally. every like, last oh, every last person in these nations and so they have to and they're powerful enough to do it and so the mm -hmm. confederacy and the empire realize at least elements within each realize that they have to work together against this new enemy the enemy of my enemy is my friend all that yeah. and even then they might not be strong enough to stop them mm -hmm. yeah because like in world war one people that we were fighting in world war ii were our uh, allies and vice versa you know um so sometimes you have to set aside those petty those, differences those in order differences. To survive. um yeah i like the yeah if you're gonna some things are not worth fighting about if you're if you and all your people are gonna die and yeah. everybody else too so that's i like that um 
So they had to, they found some common ground um, in order to. And the common ground is that we all want to live. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. All right. Embers of Hope. So this so, is all the previous books together, yes. correct? And I'll go ahead and I have a copy here. Yay. One thing that um, I hate to use this terminology, but I'm not sure if any other terminology I prefer. But I'm particularly proud of this thing here that it's in all the books uh, relevant to that book. But I have these appendices at the oh, back yeah, yeah. of each one. That goes over. I don't know how clear that will come through in the end, but hopefully that will be good. Here, I'll I'll make it where it's okay. closer so you can kind of. But yeah, it, where it describes the ships and okay. factions. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of stuff that would just really bog it down if it were in the plot itself. Okay. So like and, extra, like front matter and back matter yeah. that... Um, for those super nerds who really want to know everything about everything in the story world. Hey, you never know. I mean, um, one of my favorite series um, was Anne McCaffrey's uh, The Dragons of Pern. Mm -hmm. And she had some language, or like certain words um, um, where the average reader might not know what they're talking about. And so in the back, she had like a mini dictionary for certain terms that she used. Um, and I, 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 I don't know, sometimes that's helpful because you're like, wait a minute. And also like uh, some of the important people, like who's, who is this person again? It's been a while since I've read this. So you, yeah. you're able to go back and, and read it and, and be like, oh yeah, I remember now. And then um, kind of that way it doesn't slow down the reading part. But if you need that extra help or for the people that do enjoy uh, when you get into a series, uh, being able to get into the nitty gritty um, and all the extra stuff. So that's a big book when you held that up. I didn't realize. Yeah. Um, so before the appendices, it is, well, let's just say even with the appendices, just give you the whole, as I should. So, so it's 620 pages. Wow. And I don't remember the dimensions, but I'll hold up one of the other ones. So this is about the size of a regular paperback. So mm -hmm. how many pages would you say is in a regular paperback? Like this that one the Star Chronicles one you had there. The of mine? One? Uh around two hundred pages. Okay. So I mean like 175, that's... somewhere around there. Alrighty. And uh one thing too. One reason why it's as big as it is, um, which since you're talking about accessibility, yeah, is I did I didn't want the print to be super small, so I made. Mm -hmm. see oh, it. sorry, oh. it lagged. Okay. Oh yeah, there you go. So, because I've read those big books before with the really tiny print, and mm -hmm. I'm relatively young, and my eyes get strained, and it's like, what about older people that? It's like yeah. I want I want something that's easy to read. You don't want to, have to be worried about so right. That's one exactly. reason why it's a little bit bigger than it could be smaller, but I I wish more authors would release a large print version of their book. Um because I think um I'm a, I'm big for accessibility. Um if you know, because but also like and we're getting ready to talk about it, you do have an audio book coming, which also helps a lot of people. Um, but for those that want that like the physical book, but want something with larger print, I really wish more people would do a larger font. Um, or uh, alternatively, um, you know, I learned about this um, in some of my editing classes was that um, there are fonts out there that are more legible than others. And some of them have actually been uh, created to be easier to read for those who have dyslexia. Um, and I know Comic Sans always gets a bad rap because <laughs> everybody's like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. but Comic Sans is actually one of those fonts that is easier for um, people with dyslexia to read. Oh, and then see, they, I didn't know that. 
yeah so i mean i've i'm forever like at this point i'm like okay i'll, I'll quit hating on it you know I, it's not my favorite font but if it makes it easier for people um or there's also there's a couple of different ones i know they've they've come out with i can't remember what it's called it's going to drive me crazy now but there's one where they um they bold the first part of the word and the second part of the word is not bold and so each word is like that it's formatted like that mm -hmm. um and it makes it easier for those that have trouble reading large blocks of text um whether it is uh dyslexia or any other uh, visual impairment so it kind of helps with that staying on the page instead of it becoming like um i don't know distracting or moving about and stuff so. uh, speaking of distracting though since this isn't live can we pause it for a minute sure i i okay okay so um anyway yeah we were talking about um before the break um uh, different fonts um, helping with um, dyslexia. Because yeah. anyway. that is one of the things like I've learned along the way too, especially with making videos and stuff, is the fonts matter. Because mm -hmm. I know, uh, I think that was one thing. I can't remember what it was about now, but it was something where the uh, serif fonts mm -hmm. are good, are a... Yeah. easier more legible yeah it's like they're um cleaner i think is and they're more desirable in certain aspects just because they're clean and they don't have to like to stylize stuff on it they make it clean lines and everything mm -hmm. and it's like yeah it's i learned by doing yeah. i learned best by doing and that's one of the things i learned along the ways and because like with my logo there that font Gabriola was I had meant to make that my brand font that I would use it everywhere mm -hmm. but after a while it's like because whenever I made this thing it's like eh, it doesn't actually look that good in certain yeah. uses so yeah I I agree you know the it's a beautiful font but in certain you know um applications yeah, yeah certain applications it works and sometimes it doesn't um, and then also, like, I want to point out on your Embers of Hope anthology book, um, having the background of, like, the drop shadow, the white drop shadow behind the dark, um, I think, either black or, or dark color um, of your font and the title Embers of Hope, that really helps um, with visual. I think a lot of people would do well to um you know you want contrast yes um and i think, think if, I think if this somebody a, sorry. oh go ahead well i think this is a good opportunity uh you were talking about how you uh really for the authors and for people and people aspiring to do this mm -hmm. one thing i want to throw out there is when you collaborate with somebody like i'm not an artist uh I, the way I say it, I can't draw a straight line to save my life. <laughs> so I had to collaborate with artists and listen to what they tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is your vision and you want your vision realized. But when you collaborate with them, it becomes their vision too. And they, if they're, if you get the right person, they know what they're talking about. And yes, yeah. now we have, now we have Pippin here. Hey, she Pippin. Uh, so they like what you're talking about the embers of hope the shadow behind it i noticed it whenever before you said anything but that's not me that was the artist who put that on there and there mm -hmm. were things that she talked about uh i will put it out there this wasn't the same artist that did my other covers because she mm -hmm. was unavailable so it was a different artist but she would tell me things like uh there are things on that cover which I had told her to put on that aren't on that cover, which I had told her to include, but she mm -hmm. said, this isn't good for marketing and this is why. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you have your vision, but listen, when people tell you things, Yes. Uh, don't be all, no, I got to have my vision realized, yeah. listen and help them realize your vision the best way possible. Right. And if that person um, had any kind of, uh, training or education in their background, um, they're coming from um, a place 
of other people have done it and they know what works. Um, there's a reason why um, going to college is kind of pricey. You know, you're paying for an accumulation of a lot of people um, or a lot of people's knowledge, like years and years of knowledge uh, put together. I mean, I, I wish it was available and free for everybody, but, um, but anyway, and then also um, they're considering things that you may not be aware of. They're coming from a place of, well, um, what if the person that's looking at your book um, or looking at your cover has a uh, color blindness. And that was something that we had to, you know, think about with uh, design um, when you're designing a cover, you know, it may look really great to the average uh, person, but have you looked at it through the scope of, and there are, there are actually really neat programs out there where you can look at your image uh, through the lens of the different types of color blindness. Um, I, I know that there was a, there was an individual at the college um, and he had taught like a couple of different classes. And he said, if you are going to use highlighter or um, if you're going to circle anything, make sure that it is in these specific colors. Cause if you use this one color highlighter, I can't see it. It doesn't show up for me. Wow. So, okay. um, so yeah, I mean, you may be, certain things may be completely, um, don't even show up, uh, to, I, to, to some of your audiences. Yeah, and I have learned so much by working with these artists and everything. And they've taught me like what they need to know whenever I go in. So that way it's quicker process that I give them yeah. what they need right away. Instead of like, just like this list of stuff and they're like okay i'm not quite picturing what you're picturing and yeah and they'll and be asking you questions you're like i hadn't even thought of that yeah then there are times where you have to fight for your vision and that they might not be seeing it and mm -hmm. you have to fight for it but not all the time and yeah just listen and try to work and if you have somebody that you can work with and who is a uh well-rounded i don't know quite the word i'm looking for but they're, they have respect for you and they mm -hmm. listen to you as well. Yeah, and it'll, you can and work, work through this stuff and figure it out. It's a working relationship. You want it to go well. And, and they want to be proud of the work that they do too, because you want, um, they're going to want to say, Hey, you know, like any of their fans or followers or, or even if it's something they want to list in their portfolio for future work projects, they can be proud of what they show um, like this is the cover of the book I did for this person or, um, you know, any, any of those things. And if they're, if they're like, I hate it, you know, this person just, you know, they wouldn't listen to me and they, you know, I nicknamed them Ramrod cause that's all they, you know, they just keep shoving their thoughts through and won't let me, you know, do what I know would look good or, or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. Listen, listen to the professionals, but also um, if there's a specific thing that you have to have on it, you know, don't be afraid to stand up for what you what you want, and then come to an agreement. You know, um, one more book. This is the Star Chronicles short story collection, and. Um, you said that this was not, I see your cat. This is the first time I noticed your cats are in the, the cover. And this I, is the only one that has them. So, yeah. And cause that was the thing too, is I'm glad you noticed it. Uh, they're supposed to be kind of hidden and it shows up clearer here than it does in the physical copy. In the print. Uh, yeah. And it probably depends on the lighting too. That, mm -hmm. But uh, I couldn't think of what, the short stories in there they cover a wide variety and different characters and stuff so i was like i couldn't think of anything specific for the cover to use and so i was like you know what this would be a good time to just put a generic starfield cover on there but to honor the cats a little bit so that should be well, i guess you can't really see what i'm pointing but the top one 
-hmm. is Mary. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom one is Dodger. So, oh, I love that. So Pippin and, didn't make it, did he? Well, he did. Uh, I realize now I should have sent you a cover to back too, but he's on the back cover. Oh, is he on the back? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I, you know, and I'd looked at this, I don't know how many times today, um, but the, whatever, it just popped up. I, I was like, oh wait, those are cat's eyes. <laughs> Um, now, uh, so people need to be aware that the short stories are not with the anthology. So this is something additional. So if somebody wants to, to, and this would, might be a good, um, a good, would, the, would you say, um, a good way to get a sample of your style of writing and maybe uh. understand the characters more, or would that be more out of, cause it would be out of context. Do you think, um, there, I, that is my fear that it might be a little bit out of context and people won't understand, but it was one of my main goals to put it out there as, okay, a lot of people might not be willing to buy a whole series right away and mm -hmm. something, so they just want a little bit of a sampler. And so I feel like, yeah, there's a lot of things that uh, pertain to what happens in the books and whatnot, but I did try to make it as an introductory to me and my writing and to the universe as well as <clears throat> for people who have read it to learn more about the characters and the world that's cool so are these like cut scenes or are these more like um while while you were away this is what was going on um it's uh mostly uh s events that happened before the books oh okay. uh, before the events in the book so like uh like a prequel say, yeah so like the five main characters each of them has their origin story as to how what led to them being where they were at the beginning of the story mm -hmm. and then there's some history stuff about how the nations were formed and um wow how even like the slaves i mentioned earlier mm -hmm. uh that's actually a three-part uh three source nah uh, three parts of a short story. Uh, there are three separate short stories, three parts. So the same story told across three parts uh, about how they became slaves and why. Okay. Very cool. I think. Yep, that's the last of the slides. So let me remove that. Um, if you are ready, we can do the video. All uh, right. Yeah, just a quick... Um, explanation as to what the video is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something I kind of want to do for a while, but hasn't really worked out until recently. But getting an audiobook version of the yes. uh, series. And so that is happening now. It is in review by the publisher by KDP. I think it's still on well, Audible. ACX mm -hmm. is what they call for the publishing company for Audible. So coming uh, soon. Is this the whole anthology or is this like just book one? Or? This is the whole anthology. Uh, wow. And if it works out, the short, I do intend to get the short stories made later. Okay. But right now I'm wanting to see how this works out. And so this, what we're about to show you uh, is one of the trailers I made for the audiobook, mm -hmm. And it shows uh, just a quick bit of uh, dialogue or something from each of the main characters. Okay, very cool. So, uh, so coming soon, audiobook um, in the works and any day now, right? Yeah, a couple of weeks at most. Okay, very cool. So, couple I'm going to try and. A couple of weeks to a month, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I'm going to remove both of us and add, us, add the video to the stage so that any audio hopefully doesn't go through. So, okay. here we go. War is now over. Two nations are now one. We fight and keep fighting until we can fight no more. None of you can stand against me. Submit to my authority or the same will happen to you. I am a Star Knight, sworn to serve and defend the royal family until my dying breath. I prefer my revenge up close and personal. Embers of Hope, coming to Amazon Audible, Fall 
All right. How do you feel about um, the voice actor that you worked with? I feel um, I feel pretty good about it. Uh, it was one of those things that I wasn't kind of what I was talking about before about realizing your vision and making sure it's realized. It's like I didn't want to get somebody who was just going to read it off in some sort of monotone. Mm -hmm. And I found this guy in one of his samples. Um, and he was doing different voices in his samples, like male and female roles. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing. That, and then he agreed to do it for a royalty share. So I didn't have to pay him up front. He's going to get a share of the sales. That's and very cool. He does get into the characters, into the scenes, and there's at least one character he gave an accent to that I never saw comments. But then again, is that character? It's like okay, technically I never said where he was from, so I was like, okay, that's what they sound like now, where he's from. Mm -hmm. And it's a and he's a comic relief character too, and it just really worked out. It's like as I was reviewing the audio and everything, every time that character came in, I got a laugh out of it. So. <laughs> So it kind of brings the characters to life a little bit, doesn't it? Yes. Um, it reminds me of uh, when you have... Okay, well, for example, um, One Piece recently, uh, the live-action One Piece came to Netflix. And um, though I've not read the manga, my family and I enjoy watching the anime series. And we're like several seasons in now. And then when it when it dropped on Netflix, or I guess I should say when it arrived on Netflix, because I guess drop can have two different meanings. Um, though the characters were a little bit different, um, I loved it. You know, I think they picked a really good cast to each personality. You know, it wasn't what I originally envisioned, but it doesn't matter because I, I love... You know, just that they're a little bit, you know, like they have their own personality. It's like they're the same but different. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense. It, it does because and that's one thing that is a good point as well because what we're talking about with collaborations before, mm -hmm. that's something that a lot, I don't want to say a lot, but kind of a stigma you get, like how creative types are shown on TV and whatnot on TV shows and what's like, no, I must have my vision mm -hmm. uh, type thing. And they won't take any advice from anybody or anything. They won't let anybody do anything. To, and there are people out there who are like that. I'm not saying that there aren't, but mm -hmm. uh, media kind of tends to over exaggerate mm -hmm. it. But that's the thing that I say about don't be like that. Because the artist who made those uh, portraits, mm -hmm. uh, that was actually version three of the portraits that you saw in that. Because uh, the third artist I had to do portraits. Each one's like, huh, oh, okay. I had a certain vision but this actually i think captures the character better and then mm -hmm. same thing with the audio and what you're saying with these actors where they put their own perspective their own spin on and they bring the character and what changes from what you had envisioned even as a writer a creator mm -hmm. author whatever the changes they bring to it because of their uniqueness makes that character more unique yeah. and more relatable well and each individual reader is going to have a completely different mental image and mental voice depending on the person um, if they are, have that ability to do that um, uh, for each character so um, dodge you know may not look like um, like the dodge in my mind or i guess i should bring up a different character because that might get confusing because yeah. there's or like Hel there's Helen like the dodging call her helen Helen, yeah, Helen in, in my mind may look differently than Helen when looks in your mind and and Leon and, and Sam and all of them, you know, they they may have completely different uh um as long as it stays true to the character, because as you're reading it, it's it's they're doing what they're doing, but the scene may be laid out a little bit differently, or the um I don't know, it's just that's that's the fun thing about reading books is that the stage and the mind is going to vary from person to person, just even just a little bit, you know. And this is something as just as you're talking, it never occurred to me in this way before, but just as you're talking, can we that each individual person, real life person, 
-hmm. is a amalgamation, I guess is the best word I can think of, mm -hmm. of like say the genetics they got from their parents and how those genetics affect them, but also the people they're around, their siblings, their other family members, their friends, uh, yeah. all that uh, works together to create the unique individual. So in these, creating these characters is probably much the same thing. If you have just me doing it, that character is never going to be fully realized. But if you have an artist that draws the character that adds a bit more to it and a voice actor or a uh, live action actor, or whatever, adding something to it, that makes that character more human. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree with that. <clears throat> Well, uh, we're almost toward the end. I can't believe we've done this for an hour and a half. <laughs> when we yeah. first started, I was like, I'm shooting for 20 minutes. Yeah, hopefully people don't get bored. Uh, surely not. I mean, we have a lot of content in this. Um, so um, before we go, do you have any tips for first time authors or someone that is thinking about writing a book, but they just haven't? quite um convince themselves i'm going to do this yet like what what is your advice to first-time authors well this is i'm going to phrase it a little bit in my own words but it is also something that's very common advice from a lot of uh, people out there but the, my words the way i would put it is be more afraid of failing than tr to try than of failing itself um, and that's the way I say to myself, I am more afraid of failing to try than of being a failure, or at least being perceived as a failure, because that's one of those things where people perceive success and failure different ways. Okay. But when it comes down to it, the first stuff you put out there will be garbage. It will be terrible. And it's one of those things, I don't think we said it during our recording here, but we were talking about before. Uh, I had to tell myself I am not editing this series anymore. Mm -hmm. And as I was going through the audiobooks, like, oh man, I could have done that so much better. Or I could have done that mm -hmm. differently. How did I miss that grammar mistake? Yeah. Uh, then this is a story that I feel sums it up is uh, with the Mona Lisa. I, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but Leonardo da Vinci was never happy with it. And it was something like 20, 30 years or something. Mm -hmm. And the client finally hired somebody to steal it from him because he just would not release it. Yeah. You got just, to, you just got to do it. You got to put it out there. You got to mm -hmm. take the criticism. I mean, the mm -hmm. first review I ever got was just uh, heartbreaking. It just yeah. destroyed me. But yeah. I took, some of it was just the person being nasty. I didn't feel it was actually applied to the story. But right. there was parts of it, it's like, uh, he has a point. And I took that. So you got to put it out there. You got to be, a, you got to face your fear, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you will learn, you will grow. I mean, Triumphant Empire, that's the third edition of that book. Mm -hmm. And man, I look back at it now, it's like, oh, God. I, I just cringe. I mean, I'll well. use a, I'll use a, modern slang term it's so cringe i can't no. i can't do it but so i think part of that is because every time you go through it and that's through the editing process and the revision process and you as a writer get better and so every time you go over it again um you can find new things and new ways to to improve but I think that's where, like you said, eventually you're just going to have to let it go. It's okay. You know, like the first pancake is never perfect and you're going to have to be okay with that. Um, and the next, you know, start working on book two and, you know, like, and when you get to book, like if you, if this is something a person wants to do, if you ever get to book 15 or 20 or 30 or 50 or whatever, whatever kind of writer you want to be, um, you know, you are going to grow as a writer and you're going to improve and you're going to find ways just through the process of um, like going through KDP and going through 
audible and and learning all the ins and outs and how to talk to um, cover artists and you know eventually you get better you know at at the craft but you got to start somewhere right yes and this is one thing I want to throw out there too because um, it's something I struggle with I have perfectionistic tendencies. So whenever somebody says this is the way it has to be, I I get stuck in my head and it's not perfect unless I do. And you may disagree with me on this. <laughs> and I know a lot of people out there will. But when it comes to rules in art, they are guidelines, not rules. I and they are, they are good to follow. Uh, there are definitely times, most of the time even, where you should follow those rules. Mm -hmm. But don't if you see a scene a certain way and it violates one of those rules uh hopefully not completely throwing it out the window but bending it more than mm -hmm. breaking it then if you feel it in your gut in your heart that's the way a scene needs to be mm -hmm. then it's just a guideline yeah absolutely i agree with that um i think bruce lee said uh learn the way and then find your own way so at some point you know, like the rules are there to help. Um, they're training wheels. And and these are like writing rules is what we're talking about. Yes. Um, and like editing rules. And, um, and, I know and those we, do help make it marketable. Yes. I mean. You know, and the majority of, of them are there for a reason. Um, but even Shakespeare bent and broke. I don't know how many rules in his day. He made up words that we use today. So um, I think to be able to, to hold certain, to hold writers to a certain standard or hold yourself to a certain standard, I think is folly. Um, and and I, I don't know, I agree. Use them okay. until, until you adapt and learn what works for you. Um, and that, this applies to your own rules too. Yeah. I mean, we make our own rules, but sometimes... Uh, as long as you're not hurting anybody, that's my. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then if one of your own rules doesn't work for a scene, well, don't be stuck with it just because you said that it has to be that way. Uh, right. So um, this is kind of related to that. I know like I was coming to a close, but um, on TikTok, there was an author that asked, she was struggling with chapter length. She's like, I don't know if I should meet, reach a certain um, word count, um, or if it needs to be this, or it needs to be that. And oh, I'm drawing a blank. I don't know if it was Faulkner that wrote as I lay dying, um, which is a very interesting and kooky and horrifying and funny book. If you ever want to read it, but as I like, as I lay dying is the title of the book. It's not very big. It's a short story. Um, there is a chapter. Um, it's my favorite chapter. I have it memorized. <laughs> and it, it's five words long. And it says, my mother is a fish. <laughs> so, um, and it's, there's a reason this is, it, it is said in there. Um, yeah. his, his mom who had died, you know, the chap, the title, um, her, her, her casket fell in the river and, and, and this was like the observation of a child watching his hmm. dead mother go down the street, <laughs> you know, like, so it was like tragedy, but it was like, it's like watching a train wreck, yeah. you know, dark, dark humor, dark humor. Exactly. Yeah. Like gallows humor. Um, so, I mean, there's stylistic choices for a reason. Um, if it works for you, um, do it. Um, if it's, if you're beating your head up against a wall, when you're on a certain scene, put like an author note, like insert something here, you know, like this scene isn't finished. It needs help. And then move on and find something else to write about until the muse strikes. And then you might have to go back and like, Oh, I know what I was going to add there. You know, so. And this is uh, something that you and I discussed before a while back uh, that I remember. Pretty sure you're the one who said it, but the saying, kill your darlings. Oh, no, this would be our dear friend, Corey. Oh, okay. uh, I think I think and it's a quote. 
It's a yeah. quote from another author, but okay. yeah, kill your darlings. <laughs> yeah, there are some scenes that you get really attached to, and it's like, yeah, I love it. I love it so much. It's got, but it's like, it doesn't work within the I context. I spent the... so much time on that scene, but it doesn't serve the purpose of the book, yeah. and it, it really it draws down. out the character. And yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes it's uh, disrupts the pacing of the book, and it's like, okay, yeah. this isn't. Let's see. It was actually something I was talking to somebody recently uh about oh i know we need to bring this to a close but it's okay <laughs> uh is actually talking to the narrator and i was asking him his opinion of the ending and he said something wasn't quite as fleshed out as he thought it could be mm -hmm. well the reason for that is that the series was originally five books oh but the fourth book was mostly just nothing advanced it was just oh. just two sides going at each other, basically. And that was one of the things, basically, I was like, okay, yeah, it's going to mess it up the, because some certain things are going to happen faster now. Mm -hmm. But it just would have been a drag if I had made that fourth book. And so yeah. I had to kill that book and make it just four and combine book four and five into one book. Oh, I can imagine. You know, and, you know, if you ever watch movies with um, commentaries, I don't do it often, but every once in a while I've listened to one. Um, and there's certain um, like editor, like film editors, I don't think people understand the work that a film editor can do. Um by when a scene cuts and when is, you know, how long it is the pacing. Um, and I think a good example of that is um, the justice league, you know, like they had the release the Snyder cut, you know, mm -hmm. um, those are two completely different movies. If you watch um, Snyder's version versus, and I don't even, I'm, you know, all my DC friends are going to be disappointed in me because I can't remember what it was called before uh, Zack Snyder uh, released his version of it. But the way scenes are put together and uh, the scenes that make it and the scenes that don't really can change how a story goes. Mm -hmm. um, and the same can be said for all all movies because there are deleted scenes um, in some of our favorite movies that would have completely told it would have changed um, the takeaway, you know, like that, what the audiences will get out of it. But sometimes they have to be clipped for certain reasons, you know, for pacing, yeah. for, for book length, for there's, there's all kinds of reasons why, Certain yeah, scenes, you know, tension, you know, like, it's like people are just going to like fall asleep during this one scene. I have to cut it, you know, so. Because that's the thing, like with the Lord of the Rings, uh, there were already long movies and I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I know Peter Jackson said something to the effect that there was a lot of stuff that he had to cut out to make them. Yeah. <laughs> Even there's just three characters. hours. Long. There's characters that yeah. were complete, like. Well, I mean, even scenes that they did shoot. Yeah. And, I mean, have you watched the extended editions? Yeah. Well, um, yeah. And, okay. and like, and there had been like a big, so I'm so old that the first movie came out when JB and I were dating. Mm. <laughs> um, but um, a friend of ours was watching Lord of the Rings and I didn't realize that he had the extended version. This was before we had, we bought an extended version version you know edition um but the mouth of sauron i was like oh yeah who is that guy <laughs> and that's you know the thing like that... i had never seen him or you know and it was just kind of a you know like a shock to me of... but that's the thing though is that is a, i love a lot of those scenes but mm -hmm. watching it from a writer's perspective i was like yeah it, i can see it's better without it being in there which yeah. is funny though with the mouth of sauron one is that I don't know how many people would have noticed it without the extended edition, but after I watched the extended edition, when he kills that guy and comes mm -hmm. back, of course his sword is bloody, but in the theatrical edition, 
you see that he goes up there with a clean sword to call out Sauron. When he comes back, he doesn't do anything in the theatrical edition, but his sword is bloody in the. Yeah, it's yeah. like, like, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, something got cut out there. <laughs> hmm. Dude, was that a was that a um, an oops or is that or is there something actually? Is there because you know sometimes um, uh, things happen between takes that props and um, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Because sometimes the because sometimes the actor does such a good scene that they don't reshoot it because it won't be as good, and so you gotta leave that little oops in there. Like speaking of the Fellowship of the Ring, at Bilbo's birthday party, I read once that the cake was like some sort of polystyrene. It mm -hmm. actually caught fire. Oh no! Oh, the whole thing. But oh, no. Ian Holm was doing such a good take that they didn't want to stop it, and then it, like, that's the no that's what ended up in the movie. Notice. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, um. So talking about listening to commentaries, Super Troopers is one that you learn things from because the the actors were also because it was a originally an indie film. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, the guy that plays the sergeant, I learned um, he because he was diabetic. There's like a scene where he takes a bite of a bar of soap. I, and I think throat. I've. I, I think I've heard of this. So. Yeah, he tosses it in somebody's coffee. Well, it was modeling chocolate, but because he was diabetic, they had to have sugar free. And so like it was like, yeah, that's like a so many. I don't know. I don't remember the point of the of the scene, but like you, you just learn things along the way of, mm -hmm. of like, oh, yeah, there's a reason why um, this car was in there and not the other car. And, they're, you know, like just all the anyway. I'm I'm rambling at this point. Yeah, we, we kind of both are. So sorry. <laughs> but basically, just the takeaway from all of that is that things will change. Mm -hmm. Listen to others and uh, accept that things will change, and yeah, you'll have to get rid of stuff that you uh, really like, even mm -hmm. in order but, to make the final product. You know, uh, I'd like to add um, when talking to people about writing um it's like building sandcastles um you have to like the writing stage is you're adding sand in the sandbox don't worry about where um like how nice this column looks or how how detailed that turret on your sandcastle looks and the bridge and the moat and all that stuff Right now you're putting in the sand and you're making basic shapes, the revision, you know, the editing and revision stage, that's where you start going into details. And each time you go through is you're, you're zoning in on more detail. Um, like then you start carving out, um, I don't know, like all the, all the little windows. And then you start get you know, like each time you focus in, like, don't worry, basically to put it in context, don't worry about grammar and punctuation mm -hmm. in the writing process that, you know, cause you may be deleting paragraphs. You may be deleting chapters. Um, things may completely change. Um, so it, when you get, you know, cause you were talking about, um, uh, rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Um, if you get bogged down with an editing mindset while you're writing, you're never going to finish, you know, first get it done and let it sit for a minute, you know, like a day or two or like a month or whatever, <laughs> and then start worrying about global edits. You know, does it make sense? Do these character, you know, is there an issue with the time and all that, um, which I could make a whole nother video on editing. But basically my point was write it first. Rough mm. drafts are rough dra are rough for a reason. They're supposed to be ugly. It's the, it's the thing, like if anybody reads it before you've gone through it, and that's when you're like, it's a rough draft. So it's really bad. <laughs> you know, it's really bad writing. But the point is you you're getting the story in there. Don't worry about, don't sweat the small stuff yet. Don't worry about comma errors. Don't worry about, um, you know, did you use the right version of there, there, and there, or, you know, like, don't worry about that stuff yet. 
that can be fixed later on. You know, that's future use problem. Because <laughs> yeah, uh, my method for doing that, for getting the story down and then working on later is I outline my stories first. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did with the uh, Star Chronicles is I outlined all five books wow. first. And then each time I finished one and I started the next one, it's like, okay, well, things have changed. I had to do the hotline all over again. Mm -hmm. And then when if I went back and did the rewrites, oh, well, now I need new outlines again. And mm -hmm. So that's the way to keep it all together. But then that's also a way, good way to get the story down quickly and succinctly. Mm -hmm. And then that way, when I do get to manuscript, because I can't stop myself from editing as I go. It's just going, if I, if there's a sentence that doesn't, isn't working, it's going to stay stuck in my brain as I, and I can't think of the next stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that works for me is with the outlining means I am getting the story down. I'm getting it out and the outline, I don't care how it looks. It's just, yeah. it's notes. It's not set in stone. Yeah. yeah. And then then I can worry about the editing as I'm doing the manuscript. So there's different ways of doing that. And that's another thing, because there are people out there say, oh, I never outline. Outlining's dumb. And other people yeah. say, oh, you got to outline everything. It's like, no. Yeah. The pantser find versus works, the yeah, plotter. Find, find what works for you. Mm -hmm. So before we glow, we go, not glow. Uh, do you have any comments before we head out? Um. I guess just since you put the thing up there uh, on YouTube, I don't have a whole lot of stuff related to my stories as of yet. There are some things on there like trailers and uh, a couple of trivia things, but I really don't want to get too much of that because I want unique artwork and uh, animations and stuff. And that's uh, a lot of money that I don't have the budget for. So a lot of that is actually uh, fan videos uh, tributes to my favorite things like yes there's a lot of bad one five on there but there's also some star wars and that's thing, all right. least, and uh water ring stuff and uh all some even of some music stuff i mean i actually i don't know if you heard of sabaton the band i took one of their songs and combined it with scenes from bad one five and so far the comments on it have been like oh, people really love that so well good it's all oh, kind of just um what do you call it um it's like your little creative outlet playground yeah area. kind of and it's kind of like an area to hang out with like-minded people who like the same things i do and mm -hmm. then over here in a corner i hate like oh hey this is uh, my own stuff yeah go, go take a look at that too if you want <laughs> <laughs> there you go all right so if anybody is interested in checking out author dodge marin his books are available on amazon and also Kindle, right? Yes, so, they are both print and ebook. Okay. And, and is it on audiobook? And soon and in the near future on audiobook. So stay tuned to his social media um, because he will announce when that's finally released. And all right. Anything else? I think that's about it. Still got all right. yeah. Well, yeah. I. Appreciate we got, you. We got to end with a cat. Oh, see you later, Pippin. Yeah, he is sleeping, <laughs> so he's not too happy with me. Like, right you woke me up. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to talk with me about your books. Um, I look forward to hearing the audiobook. I look forward to reading through the anthology again. I don't think I've read it since the most recent revision um, or the last revision. So. But other than that, um, all right. So I'm I'm going to try to put together an article um, to post on geekycool.com. Um, but anyway, thank you so much. And, and thank have you a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.